welcome to everybody for us you know from the krishnamurti foundation in kolkata you know ever since the covid struck you know it's been quite a problem because the center had to shut down and in fact you know i happened to be in mumbai uh, and i think you know with covid as well you know there was the silver line because it taught us to you know communicate use technology better uh, so that we can communicate beyond boundaries and so we started this process of you know using uh, online uh, zoom etc to have our on online uh, dialogues with uh, our groups and most important i think we were able to connect with some remarkable people and so we had a a few online interactions with authors some of you some of them may be familiar to you uh, one of the first of them was nandini patnaik who is from odisha so she has written an, uh, two books and we talked about her latest book so her latest book was uh, a book called living is not a choice in which she used you know real life stories to communicate krishna ji's teachings you know. so nandini lives in los angeles then we were very fortunate to have michael mendiza and it was a real treat to listen to michael because uh, when he spoke about his book uh, unconditionally free it is the first time that i've seen an author present something in such a robust manner right it was so clear that michael had made all this his own actually and i'm just waiting some or the other i think there are problems in getting the book from us but hopefully i think things will normalize and we want to go through that uh, book it's a, i like his films and like his other work uh, this book also is like an extravaganza i believe it's a uh, uh, 300 pages very big in color so i mean that was a delightful experience to talk to michael about his book so that was the second interaction that we had and then we had an interaction with uh, an author from holland you know her name is dr marina koipa so she had written a book called inspired by krishnamurti and that was done in a very unique manner because what she did was she uh, did 10 interviews with 10 uh, persons from across different professions so and then recently very recently just as we had thought well have do we have any more authors who have written about krishnamurti there's a friend of ours called prabhat kubari prabhat is a professor in bihar and he phoned up one day he said uh, uh, kamal ji there is an author who has written a book called hey j krishnamurti a life of compassion beyond boundaries and i'm reading the book i bought the book i got reading a few extracts and i think it will be so good to be able to talk to her because you know we have with every author to view you learn something different so that's how uh, i said why don't you talk to roshan and so he talked to roshan and then i talked to roshan myself and roshan was so kind to say well i'll be there so we'll have that interaction little bit i think sir has already said how this evening will pan out uh, first i'll hand over to roshan and then she will you know have her she will give her talk for about 30 minutes 40 minutes whatever is convenient and after that you know there will be time for interaction uh, with a lively group that is here gathered today i think so once again i'm really delighted to have such a lovely span of people across from across the globe and some people who take it so much trouble i'm so grateful to mark lee and michael mendiza it's 4:30 am in california so i mean it's, it's something it's awesome to have both of you here and so many people across the globe i think from ireland and other places as well so with those words i'd like to hand you hand it over to roshan over to you roshan Uh, well thank you and good evening to everyone thank you samoh sayan and everybody at kfi and also thanks to all those attendees particularly at 4:30 am in the morning so let me tell you something about the book and uh, then if there are any questions uh, we can go into it so this book is a little bit different from the other books in that it is not a personal journey i have not written about a personal journey which krishna murthy but it is a biography which i have tried to keep as objective as possible so basically we can divide this book into three parts and part 1 looks at his life including things which uh, 
of course his close associates knew but many others would not know and uh, part two looks at his philosophy there are two chapters on that in the third chapter i go into his dialogues particularly i found his dialogues with david bohm to be very relieving re- revealing because david bohm somehow came across the same ideas through quantum physics and there are more authors today on quantum physics we, with whom we can compare krishna murthy then in the third part i look at his um, educational ideas and take up a very few experiments in education like some comments on the practical aspect of his educational theories so let me start by saying i think that krishnamurti is much needed in the world today his ideas i don't know whether to use the word ideas as he was against all ideas but anyway his thoughts or his ideas that one should drop one's conditioning and also one's identity not identify with nation caste religion i think these are of essential importance and if we could just you know imbibe these the world would be a different place beyond that of course there is a lot more question of thought and how it creates problems of self knowledge looking into ourselves all this stuff. but uh basically i would like to uh tell you first a little bit about the book some of you have read it some of have dr parik has also looked into the book uh and written a very perceptive review and there are others also so let me first uh, say how did i come to write this book well i started reading um, krishnamurti i think the first book i read was the years of awakening and when i saw those words of his the uh, truth is a pathless ma- land and you can't bring it down from the mountain uh i was quite uh, hooked by these and a lot of what he said i had already thought of i mean i already felt let's say not thought of which is why he resonated with me so that was in the late 1970s then uh, in the early 80s i heard him a couple of times in delhi but overall i preferred to read him a few years later i thought of going to rishi valley to understand him better so i joined rishi valley in 1988 as a teacher of history and geography which was of course a very good experience but i felt i wasn't quite suited to being a school teacher and so after 4 years of teaching uh, i reduced the teaching teaching was very limited and uh, i delved into the history of the school that's the manuscript that mark collected from me uh, after it was typed so during this time it was a very good experience to look at krishnamurti's educational ideas and how they were expressed in different schools um across india so i'd gone to uh, blue mountain school and um, that was a very good experience. uh briefly to rajghat and uh, also spent time in the theosophical society which provided me with old photographs and material on krishnamurti but i think the largest amount of material i got was from blue mountain school uh when you read the book you will find that uh, rishi valley school itself had a couple of phases different phases in the first phase the principal was subarao and he delved into everything in great detail uh, this who became krishnamurti he looked into every single aspect of the children's life and uh, however in the uh, after that the school declined it was even closed down 
Then Mr. Pierce was appointed. Martin Pierce had been in Sri Lanka. He was a great educationist, and he started restarted Rishi Valley School. In the early days, it was a Telugu Tamil medium and a third stream of Kannada, but now it restarted as an English public school. Mr. Pierce was there from around 1950-51 to 57-58, when uh, suddenly um, people were not happy with him, foundation members, and he had to leave. So he started Blue Mountain School. He didn't live very long after he started the school, but when I went there, uh, of course, maybe it was 93 in 1993. I found a very close associate of his, uh, Mr. Guna Vardhane. Mr. Guna Vardhane, I don't know how old he was. Maybe he was already in ninety or so. But the minute he heard the word Rishi Valley, he would fly into a rage. He would get extremely angry. He would say, "I don't want to see you." I mean, I wanted to interview you, him, but he refused. He said, uh, "Everybody in Rishi Valley is a buffalo." I can still recollect that. I don't want to see you or interview you. But I was there a couple of weeks, and then he used to call me. To, okay, okay, come and chat with me. And finally, he revealed to me that he had these boxes, trunks, trunks full of material related to Rishi Valley School, correspondence of Mr. Pierce of Krishna Ji. Oh. Hundreds and thousands of things, and he said, "I'll give you a peek, but you are from that stupid school, so I'm not giving it to you." But right on the last day, he relented. He said, "Take whatever you want from here." Now that was quite difficult because I was traveling alone. I couldn't carry much, but I went through and collected some material and uh, uh, handed it over to Rishi Valley for their archives. So Blue Mountain was is one of the schools which still closely follows Krishna Murthy principles, but in a much uh, in a very different way. So I do think that these there should be many more schools which are looking into all these ideas. So anyway, after going to Rishi Valley, I had uh, left there in 1994. Before leaving, I wrote a book on history of India for youngsters because I recall saw that middle school children had nothing to read, nothing they wanted to read. I also understood the level at which the middle school could read. So I wrote this book, and after a few years, it was my first published book. So indirectly, I would say that. Rishi Valley and Krishna Murthy even led me to become a writer, because after that many more books followed, and this is my twelfth book. So this book in particular, I would like to go into. I mean, all along, right through, right from the time seventies, late seventies up till now, I have carried on. You know, reading Krishna Murthy and also discussing with some people, but. I'm not. Anyway, let me get back to the book. So let me describe the book a little bit. So it has twelve chapters. In the first chapter, I look closely at both theosophical ideas. With without theosophy, Krishna Murthy would not be there, because they had these ideas of the Messiah, the world teacher, the root races. Some of you may be familiar with all these. and it is still puzzles me and puzzles me to this day and i think you all also i would love to ask you all this question why did led peter uh, choose krishna murthy what was it about him was led peter really someone who could see auras and who found him to be wonderful or was it some kind of chance If it was a chance occurrence, then how did Krishna Murthy become what he became? So one can only presume that he did have some sense of what this 
boy was whom he saw standing on the beach and who nobody thought much of at that point of time so when we look into the training that led beta gave krishnamurti and his younger brother nitya it's uh, my uh, conclusion that a lot of that stayed with krishnamurti throughout his life there was an emphasis on neatness cleanliness physical fitness um you know i believe he used to insist on polished boots combed hair uh, clean nails and so on and these things even though krishnamurti may have forgotten where they came from these things he continued to do throughout his life let peter also made krishnamurti physically fit he was a weak boy but by stuffing him with milk and porridge and eggs and making him run and cycle and play games and swimming he became you know much stronger and i think though all his life he did have illnesses i mean he had the strength and stamina which many of us don't have to go traveling across the world incessantly and speaking to audiences all the time so the first chapter looked as looks at this early beginning and uh, also then at the court case that came up where in previous uh, biographies i feel the father has not been treated krishnamurti's father has not been treated very fairly so i went into this in a lot of detail and uh, you will find that in the book that how the case went to court and uh, what the father's view was and what is interesting is even in those days there was something of what was happening today because krishnamurti's father perhaps wanted the welfare of his boys but there were other people who wanted to get rid of these western theosophists so in today's times we can look back on those times that something similar was happening then that there was a group of indians who were using the hindu newspaper which i'm sure many of you read today and writing articles in that against theosophy and supporting uh krishnamurti's father narayana naya in the case whereas the theosophist was supporting any besant theosophist in india there were american theosophists who were equally against any besant and led peter so this case itself is very interesting and then came the second question to me that why did krishnamurti not want to return to his father he was very very clear about this that he wanted to remain with led peter and any besant so he was taken to england and any besant lost the, both the cases in india but he won in england or those were the times when naturally she would win in england and so the two boys were in england for many years and we reached the first phase of his life which i would say was around 1921 he had been groomed he was fit he was uh, giving a few talks the order of the star had been founded for him but he was really you know not quite convinced of his role he even told uh, you know uh, many years later he told i think doris pratt that you know i had a myth i was this world teacher but really i was a young man i wanted to ride bikes i wanted to you know do everything a young man does and in fact by that time he had fallen in love but he was restricted all the time by knowing that he had to fit into this role but it was after 21 when we get into the second chapter which goes into his the way the process started um in ohio when they went to ohio i partly because of nitya's illness his younger brother's illness and when they were in ohio and he had this process which i'm sure all krishnamurti people know about 
which was a very strange occurrence of pain and of somehow and there was a steady progression from there towards his uh, fantastic speech in 1929 in Oman Holland he became totally disillusioned philosophy after his brother nitya's death in 1925 so this second chapter goes into this trans his transformation and his rejection of theosophy and then after that of course his own philosophy was developing but before getting into the latter part of his life chapter 3 looks at his early writings which i feel very few people look at they feel it's not relevant but if you look at it closely you will see that it's not disconnected from what he spoke later on there are many connections many things he had started saying before 1929 which he carried on saying later in a slightly different way if you look he also wrote wonderful poems between 1921 and about 1931 poems what he calls parables prose uh, fables and there is a direct connection between some of those and commentaries on living because some of them are actually repeated in commentaries on living so i feel to just ignore his early writings is let's let me say that as i'm writing an objective book more as a historian than someone who is uh, totally uh, devoted to krishna murti so i feel these early writings are also very important and it's very you know wonderful to see his poetic early poetic ecstasies with which he uh, uh, went into himself and which he expressed in verse next we get on to his mature phase where he is uh, speaking on his own without the theosophical society nitya has died but his right hand man rajagopal is with him and um, soon rajagopal and rosalind become the most important people in his life now uh, it was i think in 91 that i first read uh, radha rajagopal's book lives in the shadow um and uh, one didn't know at that time that is she writing what is true or not true or though it was a very in many ways interesting book but later on i think it was in 96 uh the book spoke about the relationship between uh, rosalind and krishnamurti which gradually turned into a sexual relationship and lasted for many years so everyone perhaps had doubt about the truth of it but then uh, mary lachans wrote this book uh, krishnamurti and the rajagopals where she said well i knew about it so what uh, so that was the trend on which she wrote and yet this book is not a negative one it actually gives so many wonderful facets of krishnamurti how he did not mind doing any work during the war years he was ready to wash dishes pick up the uh, cow dung make it into cow pats you know milk the cow if he could he couldn't actually because he had frozen fi- cold fingers but uh, he would pick up eggs from the chicken coop so all this was while staying in ohai he did travel from 1930 to 39 but then there was hard no travel during the war years he was stuck over there he used to play with uh, radha uh, rajagopal and rosalind's daughter and her cousin david and so she has some really lovely descriptions of him how they would sit on trees and drop water on his head and he would just you know react with fun to everything he was uh, uh, he enjoyed everything you find a person with total simplicity and humility so i think it's not 
a negative book and uh, one should uh, read many positive things in it anyway the the next chapter looks at this phase of his life once the war ended at the time the war ended he wanted to start traveling but he became very ill so his travel began only in 1947 as we all know india gained independence in august with huge amounts of violence and uh, refugees and krishnamurthy reached here in september of 47 in the midst of all that until he left ohio this has also puzzled me his relations with rosalind and rajagopal seemed to be good Uh, there's another biographer C V Williams and she accessed certain material in the Huntington Huntington library in California which showed that he left a will before leaving leaving everything to Rajagopal control of everything so it indicates to me it indicates to me that he still had an affection and liking for them both at that point of time however after he came to india at that time he traveled alone there were many new friends new things happening he was speaking more and somehow that phase in his life uh, he began to gradually look on with disfavor now in india what is very interesting that he was in india even when mahatma gandhi was assassinated he was in india where these where people were streaming in from pakistan where there was violence at every step but all the time what he said was look at the violence within you when mahatma gandhi was assassinated he was asked who is responsible he said you are responsible so these are some things we have to look at very deeply that what is our role when things are going wrong today we have the results of the american elections on the 10th we have uh, bihar election results which is important to us in india so can we blame anybody for what is going on around us or should we always be only looking into ourselves but very often i'm slightly at a tangent with the book but i think it's important very often i find people putting a small little quote on facebook one of these quotes which has come up again and again is krishnamurthy saying i don't mind what happens that is the secret of my peace but to take this out of context i feel is very uh, is not the right way because after all he cared so intensely what happened that he went to the world again and again and again i mean he talked incessantly in every country practically to try and bring about peace so to pick up a sentence like this uh, out of context uh, we really have to always look at his whole life anyway after this there was this estrangement between him rosalind rajagopal and we find soon uh, Alan Nodey and then Mary Symbolist on the scene and his period with Mary Symbolist is perhaps his most peaceful period the period where he was happiest and fortunately it lasted a long time almost 20 years of his life he gave him everything that he could not find with anyone else he took care of every aspect of his life with total um, admiration and adoration and uh, nevertheless there's so many things which i find in her book uh, um, krishna murthy what is it unfinished and in her diaries which are available online uh, interviews with scott forbes which are available which give us so many different aspects of krishna murthy and so in this chapter i look at these aspects of his life and uh, then uh, his finally the tragedy that 
uh, he died perhaps he was already 90 years old so perhaps it was all right and even there the simplicity he showed in uh, requesting Mark Lee to go and check the, uh, uh, which was the cheapest kind of coffin and to get a cardboard one uh, all these I think Mark has written about in his book so I have put in a little bit of that so all through his life what we found is though there were so many different aspects he was a very simple person he never tried to push himself forward despite all his pain and of course he repeated again and again the same things but in many different ways. He tried so hard to get people to understand and to listen to him. He spoke in almost all countries, not all. He did not go to communist countries though he had so many followers there. He did not go to Islamic countries. Perhaps he wasn't welcomed. But he had followers from all religions all countries, all places and unfortunately I feel he's not well known enough in India. We do have these groups, this is the Kolkata group, there are many groups but yet the common person does not seem to know anything about him. So one question is how do we raise this level of consciousness? Are people even going to accept his words if we say today, you can't be a nationalist or you can't follow any religion if you want to bring peace in the world, is anyone going to accept it? So these are some of the questions you know we need to look at and how to make his uh, thought for want of a better word uh, known more widely, particularly in India where we are facing many problems uh, uh, these days, perhaps earlier too. So now this ends the first part of the book and the second part we go into his thought what, where I have tried to put it in, very, in a very simple way making it somewhat easier for people to understand and taking it in you know about 10 year chunks of were there any changes in the way he was thinking. So the next two chapters look at this you know truth and conditioning and how to do this. Then uh, chapter 9 we look at particularly at David Bohm and those dialogues because personally I find dialogue a wonderful way to proceed. I do find dialogue, uh, I know Dr. Harshad Parikh really differs from me but I find dialogue is a great way to get to the depth of something and a one-on-one -on -one dialogue more so than anything else. So I found that these dialogues gave me a lot of insight which is why I gave more emphasis to them. Then with his educational theories, those of us who have worked in his school know that it is rather we have implemented to some extent but it is really difficult and there are many again questions to be raised. At what age can you tell a child be aware, be attentive? A child grows, you're five years old, obviously you can't. What can you do with a five-year-old? When they are teenagers, I'm sorry to say they're all off their heads to some extent. It's very difficult to get them. They may have a very rational conversation, a very rational dialogue with you, but something else is certainly going on in their head. They are hormonal changes. They cannot help themselves, they are falling madly in love with X, Y and Z or feeling upset over the smallest things. So uh, these are things we need to address in education. Um, his ideas are absolutely great. Um, it, no competition is something I believe in, which we did try to practice in Rishi Valley. No reward, no punishment. I think is another wonderful idea which was put into practice but this whole thing of how to create a new human being or encourage the child to be something entirely new, aware, attentive, uh, I don't know, you know how exactly that can be done. So this is something else I feel those of who 
us who appreciate krishna murti and who appreciate education need to delve into in great depth how exactly do we do it at the same time in rishi rishi valley we do focus on examinations we don't leave them alone class 9 and 10 we do prepare them class 11 and 12 and this also i feel is essential because that's the way our country is we can't just leave them you know um, in this competitive world we can't just say don't take an examination during mr pierce's time there was this wonderful teacher there called sardar mohammed and uh, it was a very free school at that time uh exams were as and when you wanted it well as and when the child felt that they were able to do it and one parent wrote to him saying you know what is this you know get them to do a little better and to pass exams and he said if any child that i teach wants to pass an exam then i have failed in my as a teacher and there is a long letter he wrote which i could not include in this book but a very wonderful letter he wrote to the parent you know about the pearl beyond price which could and i have a feeling that in pierce's time there was something happening but these parents cannot leave the children alone could not you know accept this they have to compete they have to think of careers so this is where it falters and we also have to live in the society get them through exams they go on to colleges i do find it interesting that so many rishi valley students i'm not sure exact proportion are living abroad not in india i'm not sure is it fear over there many of them have imbibed this no religion and no nationality but can they not do it while living in india so many of them i find are uh, in different pre- professions in different countries of course many are in india too but still is a very large proportion uh, that is not here so after all this you no know, we do really need to explore how to bring krishnamurti's ideas into the general public is it at all possible in a country like this is it at all possible uh, there are always the elite there are always these groups uh, so is it possible at all to do this Uh, so this is one of the things uh, we need to discuss then finally we have uh, the last chapter where krishnamurti did not want comparison but comparison is in- inevitable where i look at uh, certain other uh, gurus of india and uh, see how he is thought fits in finally i would like to say i think the picture on the cover and the title of the book really expresses my overall feelings the picture of the cover shows this little enigmatic smile of krishna murti he's already quite old but it's one of these beautiful smiles as if he knows the follies of the world but yet he is still trying and this wonderful picture was taken by mr hamid whom many of us know who is a friend of us many of us know him and then the title a life of compassion beyond boundaries though i have given different aspects of krishna murti i feel this is really the key to him he really had compassion for everyone it's not for plants animals the sea the air the water it's not you know enough to you know take away take one sentence and say something about him uh, based on that it is because of his compassion that he spoke incessantly everywhere to try to get people to live a different way in order to bring a 
peaceful world so i think i will stop there and we could have some questions and these things i would like everyone to keep in mind of course you can ask on the book anything you like but how do we go ahead how do we who are interested in these things who understand the problems of conditioning who understand that a uh, division arises through these firm identities is there any way forward what can be done so let now have other people thank you very much uh, that was so well put and uh, well explained and thank you again roshan so this is just for uh, the information of everyone else this is the book uh, this is the lovely picture which he was referring to and uh, it's it's about uh, how many pages it's about 350 pages it's in hard cover it's a good publication and it's available on amazon so that's brilliant i think uh, uh, would i start asking a quick question uh, roshan before others join the queue should i should i begin with a question yeah okay uh, now uh, i've got a couple of questions actually right so first i would just you know briefly say uh, congratulations once again for the launch of a life of compassion you brought this out in july this year so a lot of you might not have been able to read the book because it's out during the pandemic and it's not available everywhere uh, you've put in a lot of effort especially keeping in mind the fact that you're a historian and raw facts events and dates play an important part in your life and expressions and that comes out very clearly even with the small little journey you've had with us this evening where you have been very clear about talking about incidents and and events and actualities which which plot the trend in K's life i have also read k uh, which i have uh, you know i've read k i've read lots of his uh, biographies written by other people but i've never seen a book where there are over 60 pages of glossary notes and bibliography so that itself speaks on how much effort you have put to get uh, you know the right kind of quotations in and to keep the spirit of k's messages without too much of distortion so that's my first immediate reaction actually i've read this book uh, in the last 24 hours and i finished early hours of this morning so i'm still quite obsessed with a lot of things you've written here which is coming out very loud and clear which is brilliant in many ways uh so i can't help resisting ask you four questions roshan mm-hmm. and you're welcome to answer them uh, together you we can ask them separately the first is of course you did mention earlier that you have never met k Mm. that you are expressing uh your expressions are all based on inputs and sources and external material and from other reliable sources which you have painstakingly collected and researched and it is meant for a particular audience is that so is your yes. book meant for a seeking mind an uncorrupted and unconditioned mind by historical facts or so what is the kind of audience you're looking at who will read this book i'm actually looking at the general reader i mean someone who would not know about k and who would be introduced to all aspects of him through this book because it looks at his life it looks at his uh, thought and it looks at his educational ideas so i think i'm looking not at the krishnamurti specialist uh, but to i'm sure there are new things here also but i am looking at the person who knows nothing about him but who this book may get interested so that's interesting so obviously it's for uh, so most of us who are in part of this session have had long associations with his teachings and readings and some of have been with him for a great number of years so their interpretations uh might be different from what what you have tried to get across in some parts I, i'm not too sure whether it, one needs to agree with completely the you know with what that's in there but of course 
as a researcher you put everything across candidly in the fairness in which you're saying and and then quite a bold spirit but uh, it's been bold that's that some interpretations have definitely been bold especially your chapter 5 and 6 which you have mentioned also which is nearly 50 pages or of your two balanced to 50 pages so 20% of your book you have given attention to a lot of personal incidents in case life which has taken him through a, a very difficult period and obviously this is based on uh, a lot of things which has happened uh, with the transition he had in his life we say and otherwise so this is a biography i still go by the fact that you have this is an attempted biography right because it's not mentioned everywhere but i think you have said this earlier that this is a biography so it covers everything which you deem fit in science and, and objective biography an objective biography so uh, yeah so the second question of mine is that you have therefore attempted a biography in 250 pages of 90 years of a person which itself is an incredibly difficult task because uh, it's 400 uh, no uh, yeah but i've taken off the glossary oh, and I've taken away the 50 pages which you have given for chapter 3 oh. and so i'm talking about the balance pages actually which which makes it even more difficult because you've got a limited amount of you know space to do this so the question which i ask is some of the comments you have made there now i'm asking this in the fairness in which i think i've got this right to ask as a as a reader and someone who's been reading a lot of kay for the last 30 years or 40 years of my life i even attended one of his uh one of his discourse uh, he gave in calcutta way back in 1982 so you have mentioned that you have even quoted rom landau and mentioned them most of kay's speeches are confusing and his answers would be dissipated in similes and metaphors and i think you've quoted him saying this and yet you have printed on the cover truth is a pathless land now this is something which you have mentioned also in the book that he's very simple in his expressions it's just that you need to understand the simplicity of his expression so in one part where you have mentioned rom landau mentioning this but perhaps uh, i was a bit confused as to why that was put in there could be could be to explain that in some form Are you with me with the question? Yeah, I'm with you with the question. I feel Rom Landau was important because he was probably one of the few people who met him at that point of time and who both heard him speak and interacted with him in a personal capacity. So I hope for this because I mean these are the contradictions in his life. uh and this was very early it was 1934 so probably his thought and all was still forming so in a in a personal communication he found i think i have mentioned there that rom landau found his talk fine but it's when he came to the personal communication that he felt he would sometimes say one thing and sometimes another thing so this is just his opinion which i because he was an important biographer of those days that's right okay so i'm agreeing with him or with anyone and merely uh, uh, putting in what he said um, because at that time his was one of the best uh, descriptions of the man he had known him many years he met him earlier when he met him later he describes his transformation physically also Okay. It's Ram Lambo also who brings out his, his uh, uh, what he said about uh, Jesus. So I feel it was quite an important uh, book. Thank you for that. It's not agree with him. It's it's his view, but I think it's important. And my last question is is very uh, it's, it's on chapter eleven, the Krishna Mitra schools, which you talked about in detail. You were there for six years and. you interacted with both the students and the staff and the curriculum so there's a very interesting comment you made there uh, you said that you found i think if i am not right you did mention that uh, the teachers had less freedom than the students so that's a very interesting kind of statement which has lots to say about what it was there so perhaps you could elaborate on that i said that i don't know what other ex rich valley people here feel Mm-hmm. but uh, a little bit 
Like, uh, so Sundaram was a person, so he knows nothing of all this. Uh, and uh, Dr. Harshad Parik, I think, had already reached a certain level where this won't bother him. You know, as a history and geography teacher, I had got ten to six classes per week. In addition, there was this early morning duty, then there was F U D of course, then there was Astakal duty, then I was a house parent. You could not step out of the school uh, until you took permission. Uh, even if you wanted to step out, there was no way to go. But you know, those were early days. I'm sure things are different today. But I felt that we did everything possible to see to all the children's needs, but not to needs of the teachers. At that stage, I'm talking very long ago. Nevertheless, I think I mentioned in the book the principal, Mrs. Thomas, was a very wonderful person, and she did try to see to all your needs. Right. But you were overburdened. There was no time to think of Krishna Murthy, frankly, for me. So after the walk, it was a dead sleep because he was so exhausted. Get up at five thirty in the morning to send the children for P two because you are responsible for them as a household. Exactly. You have one duty after the other. Plus, you have to prepare for teaching. You have to correct hundreds of books. You know? And finally, you do prepare them for the exam. So I used to take it very seriously. Not all people do. As an academician, I took all this very seriously. Teachers have different approaches, and um, then you can't get out of the school. In those days, there was no nobody had personal transport in those days. So um, you kind of stuck. I loved Rishni Valley in many ways. I mean, the children were good, the teachers were wonderful, the atmosphere was fun. But I was happy to be over there. Brilliant. Rishni was also wonderful, but you know, I couldn't live in uh, that sort of way. So that's my personal view. I'm sure other teachers have been. That's right. I I now request uh, if the house is open, so anybody wants to ask some questions. You just just unmute yourself, or you can just raise your finger. I'll I can pass it on to you, and uh, you you have to do it. How many would you like to start? I find that the people look at the person first, who is speaking on truth, all these things, God, no God, religion. The common man looks at the person who is speaking, and I find. Most of some uh, good number of pages uh, have been spent uh, to present the case of Rosalind and all these things. See, I am not a Puritan person by, uh, mm. but what I was wondering as a common man, what impact it would leave behind in the man in the minds of the masses? Would he or she feel inspired to proceed further to uh, have a look at? What was his philosophical view? How? What was his approach to truth? All these things, all these important things, because what I personally feel, I may be absolutely wrong, and moreover, it is not my opinion. You know, I was just wondering what may be the likely impact on the mind of the people. Will they feel inspired to proceed further to complete reading your entire book, or they will feel dampened? That is my question. Yes, I understand your question, and uh, I did give this some thought. But I decided that it is very important not to create myths and to present the truth. What people make of it is a different matter. But I don't want to, you know, uh, uh, glorify or present something that is suppressing all these things. I want it to be. Every aspect of his life should be there, and I do feel this does not detract from his message. If others feel that it does, it's up to them, because I don't want to be a myth maker. Many people write biographies; they glorify someone, they put in only the good things, and the bad things are suppressed forever. I'm not saying these are bad things. But I want it to be a true process, not a myth. No matter what people say, 
true to myself and in in my heart i have to write what is it i think you have to probida was trying to ask the question that are we seeing the corner of the field or are we seeing the total field if you are seeing the total field you will you will see no oh. corner so as you go to the book you will see the total field that's absolutely yeah so that's a prerogative which is there with the author which and you have it's been brought across very well because you have segmented it between chapters so one has a clear feeling of and it's more or less time period wise so i can get that really well is anybody else wants to ask any questions yes dr parik please so dialogue um i don't uh give so much importance even with david bohm i found that those dialogues were very intellectual to me whereas the dialogues which are given in commentaries on living they are very wonderful and in a very straight forward way krishna murthy is asking questions and leading to the person people of many different backgrounds who were not very art- articulate like david bohm but even simple people they can listen to him and then they begin to see something what he was talking about so if one wants to really go deep into what is this i or me one has to look at the source from where thinking arise and i was very curious i was doing my phd at that time and i had not come across such a wonderful statement that thought creates the thinker and then thinker tries to change thought and this duality between thinker and thought is the source from which all our psychological problems arise you know i don't know it's about the book uh, maybe i'm looking at my own mind uh, Russian once uh, I read that uh, Shishmuti uh, did not allow many uh, symbols to go out because he said that evil uh, will come over him. The fear, yeah. <laughs> so uh, since I don't know anything much about his personal thing, so what I am doubting in my own mind, what I think is fear, because he himself has talked about getting into the root of fear. Whereas, where I read in your book that he did not allow Mary to go out because he was so fearful of whatever. So, like, uh, I would say that there are some very complex things which we don't understand. Mm-hmm. Every single teacher has uh, certain things that he does not, he or she does not reveal to everyone. he revealed all this only to mary symbolist and now it has been put online so i have used those sources but i feel that um, i feel as i said it's important to give a full picture and a true picture in a biography but every person has certain every great teacher has certain hidden aspects which others would not normally understand i mean i had heard even when i was in rishi valley even popol jayakar had mentioned it that this occult aspect of krishna murti was always there um, it was known to many people that he had buried jewels around the school for its protection and it was known to many people and popol jayakar mentions it in her book how he felt the goddess from the tetu temple was following him back into the campus and he told her to stay there um, and not uh, come after him so there are these things we just cannot understand we don't have that knowledge or ability to understand it but it is there in all these teachers that there is a hidden world which they don't reveal to everyone uh, now it has been revealed I have put some part of it in the book. Brilliant. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like yes, to ask? Yes, I. Sorry, Joyita. I want to ask. Yes, yes. I want to. I want to say something to Roshan ji. Uh, Roshan ji, I am not. I have not yet uh, read 
much of great case teachings or uh, i have heard something some i have interacted on some uh, aspects of case teachings but uh, one thing i was uh, i used to worry um, that uh, his teachings impart so many things uh, uh, but uh, it always it seemed to me that it always focused in what is to be a good how to flowering or how to help in the flowering of goodness among us but uh, today i heard from you about your book i had heard about it but i had i didn't have the opportunity to read it or buy it but now i am more interested in k because uh, from what you said about k it has made clear to me that he was a human being he was a human being with his ambivalence and with his transitions and that makes uh, k uh, more readable for me or, or otherwise i would have kept him like a guru however he uh, emphasizes how much k emphasizes don't make me a guru don't believe in a guru but i would have made him a guru but your book had shown me or illuminated k as a human being and that is a very important thing that i found today thank you very much so nice um i think he was a human being with all, all his with all the human beings complexities but he had a message to deliver and he delivered that message despite whatever he may have been in his daily life you know sometimes i think about him because i do really uh, you know try to understand him in many ways and i somehow see him as a man with a mission he had a mission to deliver this message it was such a strenuous thing this is how my own personal thing i have not put this in the book but it's my own personal feeling it was so strenuous to do this he had to have a clear and vacant mind at the times that he spoke so that he could convey this truth without any other thing coming in the way and i would guess that after every talk he was exhausted and anything he did you know to survive was kind of justifiable i see said in this book how he used to watch movies he used to listen to music he used to read books but he loved to watch movies he had to do something to keep himself on that path to be able to deliver the message he did everything for with that aim whatever he may have done you know in his life as a human being but his aim was always clear he has to deliver this message uncorrupted that's my personal that's understanding right. of him because yes. otherwise i find so many contradictions in his life they are there but then this understanding came to me that there was only one important thing in his life somehow or the other the message has to be delivered to everyone everywhere and yet we must understand that he was a human being he was living in this world not without with all its pressures even though he was taken care of brilliant so we can't let this opportunity go by when we have mark with us so we request mark to say a few words really that will will be something which will add to everything really that's the the question about whether krishnamurti had fears or no fears uh is is a very minor question uh, as as roshan has shown uh krishna murti was a human being and uh, he had fears he he got angry uh, he got upset he had normal human reactions and uh, he dealt with these uh, i i saw on many occasions uh, grappling with these emotions than himself uh so it's not, they're, they're not uh, i think we run the risk of turning uh these kinds of questions into myths in an attempt to uh create a an a uh, man who was not real uh and krishna murti was very much real so the question of anger and so on i think the and, and then the other question about whether 
about good and evil. He said, interestingly, he said, there are two, good and evil are two parallel streams. He said that uh, evil can definitely affect goodness, but goodness does not affect evil. So that's a rather complex thing to consider. Uh, you have to look at it in the context in which it was delivered, uh, but it's an, uh, these enigmas uh, come repeatedly uh, and are left for us to uh, unravel. Uh, but I think the danger is trying to turn any of this into uh, a, a, an image or a concept or a um, larger than life uh, impression of Krishnamurti. So, as someone has already said, uh, when the issue comes up, it's not so much whether Krishnamurti was a victim or Krishnamurti was uh, imbued with this, but uh, the question is, are we? And the question is left for us to consider. That's all. May I say something? Thank you, Mark. I'd like to say something about Krishnamurti, and that though he was a human being, Certainly, but he had over he had overcome one instinct that all of us human beings have, that the instinct for survival, and that he had no instinct for survival. That protect self protection. Now, as a result, he was intensely vulnerable. That's one. I would like to say that. And the second thing I would like to say is that he had um, uh, he had a concept of evil as independent force. And that, you know, it reminds one of uh, Christ. For instance, in the Bible, Christ is supposed to have said, uh, Satan, get, get thee behind me. And he did have that, that almost metaphysical idea of uh, sense of evil as something that would swamp the good. So, and without protection, he found himself in all kinds of difficult situations. That's all I want to say, that that is a part of him that I myself feel we should acknowledge, that as Roshan says, it was a difficult life. You know, it was a difficult life for most people of that kind, enlightened men live in one place and are looked after and protected. He did not. He, he went out. And uh, he, his life was what, what it was, full of contradictions. And that's all I like to say. That there is that vulnerability to him, which is, I think, one should appreciate him. That's what I want to say. And Radhika, thank you for requesting uh, Roshan to come across to Dehradun. I think that's why all this happened. The book happened because she was there for a couple of years, for six she years. Her mother was a writer and she, um, she sort of fell under the influence of Krishna yes. and made the effort to investigate what he was all about. And that's, that requires a lot of work. And the book seems to be, I haven't read it yet, I mean to read it. It seems to be uh, very uh, well written, well investigated piece of writing. And how were her initial reactions when she came down from Delhi to Dehradun, from the university to a well, school? I would like to take a bit of uh, credit for asking her to come because I was after her to come. Right. She confessed <laughs> that really. She said that in the other day and said that that's the reason she came across. And yes. so I would so thank very you. Happy to have her and, uh, and some of our students have become historians, which is very nice. Um, and she has a legacy in Rishi Vedic. And she, her book, um, her research has yielded this book, which we have published for the first 40 years. We've edited and published. So she has left a mark in Rishi Vedic, for which we are very grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Radha. It's so nice to see you. Oh, is that Roshan speaking? Yes, it's Roshan. <laughs> okay, good. Lovely to see you. 
And maybe you can send me your emails. I can send you some things. Radhika.rishivalley.org uh, What is your email? Radhika at rishivalley.org Okay. Sure. Now yeah. this video is going to go on YouTube very soon, so the whole world will know your email now. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's a public email. Thank you. Yes, Sanji, can yes. I have a small question? Yes, to it has to be a quick sure. question and it has to be precise. Yeah, very quick, very quick question. Uh, Madam, actually, we have not been able to go through your book, but what I heard from you that you have also written a few chapters on education and uh, you have tried your best to see to C2K from a historian point of view. My question is uh, about his, he has been a great institution builder apart from his great ideas. Uh, has his ideas of education evolved historically I think, uh, I'm sure there was some evolution in his ideas on education. But all his educational ideas were geared towards making a different kind of person. What he used to call a new human being. And uh, I have said in my book that perhaps neither Rishi Valley nor anywhere else has produced a new human being. But definitely these schools have produced better human beings. And uh, his educational ideas were to bring out, aim to bring out the best in children by not forcing them to compete and uh, to say, I am good, the other one is bad. And this is something I think in Rishi Valley at that time long ago, and I'm sure today, uh, is kept in mind by all teachers. The children are not compared and so they are able to grow in their own way. And any youngster who has some special abilities is encouraged in some way or the other. This was, as I say, long ago. Uh, Radhika can and uh, Pinakshi can expect it better what is happening today. But I'm sure these values are still there. So, and also, I have read and I have put in my book that there's a special emphasis on um, teaching history differently. I think Radhika is uh, responsible for that. <laughs> about this whole thing of pride in the past, I read about this. I put that in the book also. So there are many ways in which a school can make a difference. I think Krishnamurti had seen some of the ways but it's up to each individual teacher and each individual principal in the many different schools to put this into practice in the way they think best. Thank you so much. Thank can, you I, so much. can I just say something? Yeah, please. Yeah, please. yeah, I just wanted to respond to what Roshan said about uh, students from Rishi Valley who uh, end up going abroad and are in different parts of the world while they could stay in India and perhaps work in India, which oh, is... I think they could stay in India. I yeah. didn't add that. Uh, okay. I merely mentioned. Okay. I didn't so say I, that. Uh, I just wanted to say that your own book has the title or the subtitle of Krish Beyond Boundaries. I think I, I just saw that briefly. Okay. And um, uh, Krishnaji considered himself a citizen of the world, really. And I think in Rishi Valley and in the other schools, perhaps, the emphasis is on developing a kind of global outlook and a concern for humanity. So in that sense, I think it's not such a bad thing if they want to be in different parts of the world. I know it's uh, India needs a lot of young uh, people with good minds and good qualifications to work in different sectors of society. And uh, we do have now many of our students doing that as well. But I, I think, uh, I mean, I just wanted to share that I don't see this as an apprehension in the same way as you seem to for the moment. No, I don't think it was an apprehension. It was only a comment. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Yeah, I'm just sharing my viewpoint with you. Yeah. I don't mean that they should stay in India. Yeah. It was merely a comment. Uh, it was a, 
a question about why this happens not yeah. that they should be in india not at all Thank you anyway for a very uh, moving talk. We really enjoyed listening Thank to you. you. Yeah, listening Thank to you. the talk and to the discussion that followed. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. If there are any other questions because we have overrun our time and Kamal ji is a stickler for time. So I deeply apologize for us running. We have crossed it by a couple of minutes, but I think it's been exceptional this whole session which we have had. It's been different. Uh, Kamal ji, would you like to do a quick wrap up, or should I help you with that? <laughs> no, he's celebrating the victory still, so it's okay. Yeah. Thank you again. Uh, this has been brilliant. Kamal ji, would you like to just make a yeah. quick wrap up? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, as Sayan said, I think one of the things you know, when I look around the screen, it's so good to see. Firstly, you know, I think so many people from around the world, actually, as as I mentioned, from Ireland, uh, from. from California and all parts of India, all parts of India, literally. So it's really wonderful to see that, and also to see so many people with whom you know we've been closely associated, Radhika ji, and I saw Swami Chidanand ji there, but somehow I couldn't see him on the screen. I saw Chhabra ji was there, and from uh, Italy is there also, yeah, from Italy. Because yeah, from Italy. Italy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also from Italy, that's right. So and question, we need your email. We want to be in touch with you. <laughs> so I think you know I mean and thanks to uh, Roshan for a really wonderful talk this evening because you know when we as we were approaching this talk uh, there were uh, so many things flying around you know there was uh, uh, one part you know was saying there was expressing concern you know there is you know the concern that one would expect when people are very fond of somebody and then they feel that maybe this is a book that brings the person down and then there was the other side which which said well you know it's a very very balanced perspective and it brings out everything and i think at the end of it though i have not read the book i think it's is the sort of thing that krishna ji would probably himself have encouraged he would probably have encouraged the courage to listen to everything and see what is i am just trying to put it you know perhaps in the way i saw it i did not see myself my view of krishna ji threatened in any way by you know whatever was being referred to from either side those who had read the book and said that there was this uh, part that was they did not like and those who had read the book and they found it very balanced so once again roshan thank you so much for this evening and thanks to all our guests for making this evening so special and we will be in touch with you i'll be sending a follow up email and we will soon have this video on youtube as well thank you thank so you much. thank you thank you everyone and thank, thank you especially to thank you thank you thank you absolutely thank you. Yeah. bye bye everyone bye bye bye, bye. 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 b